fix the whole sticker. Maybe the first warning should go out, sticking onto the windshield. You put it on the windshield wiper, let them know. Maybe the second time, you rip a little piece off and put it on the glass to kind of be nice. They're neighbors. I guess the third time you can do what you need to, but remember that'll be an irate person uh, having to yes. scrape off a sticker. You got bigger ones? Yeah. <laughs> That's right, exactly. I guess if you bring it to my attention, we'll make them bigger. If that sticker warning. They should have a, a warning a first, second, and third strike. Um, snow plowing. Wind is upon us. One of the programs that I proudly funded was the Wildcat program. If we had elderly, now please, this is, I want to make sure that you use me and don't abuse me. <laughs> we funded a snow plowing program for those members in this district that are either too elderly or are not physically capable of plowing the snow in front of their homes. It's limited funding. So if you can afford, if you can snow, if you can plow, please do so. If you have children at home and if you can get them off their Xbox, please have them do it. You don't have the financial resources to hire someone, please let me know. But if you take this service, you may prevent someone else that could use it and really needs it. In any event, please contact my office so we can get your address and information um, on the list before it snows. So don't call me the day of and say, hey, I heard you got that program, I want to sign up. It doesn't work that way. Um, the group has to prepare way in advance of the number of homes and depending on the amount of snowfall. Halloween will be continuing the traditional celebrations with the assembly woman, uh, not only at PS105, uh, uh, but we'll also be doing it on Mars Park and continuing on East Tremont. I encourage all to take part in our safe streets and safe treats Halloween at Mars Park Association along with the Mars Park Bid uh, and Big Deal have sponsored uh, the one on Mars Park, and if you recall, it was four years ago now, there was that tragedy where the car lost control, uh, and that driver, by the way, was convicted for not taking his medication. He gets convicted. That resulted the in the goes. death of three people on Mars Park on Halloween. A grandfather with his grandchild that were trick or treating, and um, another uh, individual that was out there with his sister. Tragedy that we can't forget, and we should do all that we can to protect our trick or treaters to make sure. And we should also keep an eye on them. It's not only the cars, uh, but we have uh, people out there that could be preying on our kids, and that's always a day that's a concern because of the costumes and uh, all the other. Uh, uh, festivities in and around the celebration that can allow or, or expose our children to conditions uh, that we would generally uh, be more uh, aware of and preventing. So if anybody has any questions, uh, get answered. All right, uh, let's start with Edith, then uh, Marcy. I also went to that meeting Monday night, and I was there. Um, <clears throat> With all due respect to you and Natalia and to our deputy inspector, R49 is doing everything in their power to eliminate all this garbage in our community. But because of the judges and the district attorney, they're let loose. My answer to Garcella, I'm sorry, the district attorney was, it was up to me, I'd like a mother to throw away the key. She didn't like it, and I'm sure she doesn't like me, and I really don't care. Uh, as a politician, as two politicians sitting here, we have nothing to offer our teenagers. They come out of school, they come out of high school, they have nowhere to go but get into trouble. We need some kind of after-school activity. Either open up the schools, let them get into the gym and play ball. We need a center for every single area in the 11th. 
Community Board 11. We're asking for your help. We will help you, we will do, I'm just sitting in the body with Bernadette. We will help you as much as we can, but we need something where our kids can go. You have to educate the children first before you expect them to go on the right road. Either thank you, Pat. I just want to respond to you. For the longest time, I've worked for this community, our men and women are blue on doing their job, but they're turning a blind eye, they're not arresting the criminals, they're allowing drug dealers to continue, they're allowing those that prey on our stores and small businesses and not arresting them for the laws that they're breaking, um, and basically saying they're allowing the lawlessness to continue. The importance of that meeting was to bring them all in, because we would bring, we question the NYPD, they would say it's not us, it's a DA. We question the DA, the DA say, would say it's the judge. We question the judge, the judge would swing right back to the NYPD, mm -hmm. and all you had was finger pointing. And it's regrettable that I couldn't be there. I assure you folks that this is not the lack of enforcement um, or responsibility that our men and women in blue are not adhering to. This is a broken system mm -hmm. that the DAs aren't demanding higher bail, and I'm not saying everyone needs to, to be arrested. We should have mass incarcerations. But when we have 50 prior arrests, it's no longer debatable because you need another second chance. Oh. And we create the arguments for them. So the district attorney isn't asking for high bail amounts. The district attorney isn't asking for that individual to remain behind bars until there's a date set for his trial. And the, the judge is given the discretion of, I'll use an example for a, a crime, up to a year behind bars, or we give them 20 hours community service or force them to go into a program for drug abuse which puts them right back on our street. This individual went right back to the same store that he was arrested at repeatedly. And he told the cops, I'm going back. And there's nothing that you can do. Yeah, and the, and the deal that kills him. So gonna we start to cop the court watches program. We write letters and send them to the um, the presiding judge, the administrative law judge, the district attorney, and list all of the community boards, associations, to say this person needs the maximum allowable by law for these crimes. Then maybe we can get them off our streets and get them the help that they need. But this revolving door is taking its toll on this community. It, it certainly is. And I did not say that the 49th is not doing their job. They're doing more than their job and a very adequate job, but we're not helping them any. We're making life tougher to them because these guys come out. She wanted us to give ideas of what kind of rehab we can give this jerk that's been arrested 52 times. What's the rehab? Walk him up. Sounds good to me. You're the district attorney. You're coming to us for our ideas. They did the, I wasn't there. What they, I hear what they said is the state has to change the law. And there you go. The, the punishment. Yeah. Just follow the laws on the books. We don't have to make them stricter and more, more uh, increase the level of punishment. Take away the judge's follow discretion. The law. The interpretation is allowed to that up to that judge, unfortunately. So I agree with you. Thank you. Mercy. So thank you, first of all, Captain. Now, notice my amount of calls have decreased. <laughs> so thank you very much for doing a great job, pointing that crazy. And that's number one. Number two, um, addressing the Halloween thing. White Plains Road is a nightmare for parents and children who feel entitled to go into every store and bang their hands on counters, not buying anything from these stores, and demanding candy. So Halloween. in support of the private homeowners and the store owners, if you don't want to give candy, shut your doors, put a sign in the window, no candy. No one is entitled just because it's Halloween and you're a child, big or small, to get candy from anyone. That's like sticking them up. It's a, a passive crime. It's a shame. 
It's Halloween. Oh, man, not that. That's what I do have to Halloween is a bad title. Isn't that a title? Like big and large. There's none there. Okay. I have some at the table there. One day out of the year. One day. They have a whole year to prepare for Halloween for the kids. Really? I won't shop at a store. I just want to acknowledge who was part of that that spearheaded and brought to our attention this revolving door scenario um, with this individual. So I want to thank one of that for uh, continuing the deserves a round of applause. Rabbi, you want a question? Can you stand in the mic? Thank you. Uh, good evening. I have actually two questions. Is that okay? Can I do two at a time? One. Keep it short, please. Okay. She said he's a rabbi. You can get two questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and it's actually for the assemblywoman and the councilman. They can take either question. Okay. So the first question is one of the reasons I get for the young people not to move into this neighborhood is because of the access to Manhattan. They said the express bus takes about three weeks, the subway takes about a month, what? and they need some quick access to Times Square, Grand Central. This whole thing with the Morris Park Station, this is becoming like east side access too. I mean, this has been spoken about for 10 years, eight years, it would be the greatest thing. And I think it would be a major attraction for young couples, professionals to move into this neighborhood like the gentleman said, you could be in Manhattan in 20 minutes. It's an amazing thing. Here, you could get to Metro North, and my friend Joseph over there can tell you, but it takes you about an hour to get to Metro North to get to Pelham Parkway, down Pelham Parkway. So although it takes you 20 minutes to get in, it takes you an hour to get to the station. So I guess my question in the form of a question is, is there anything that could take it up to a higher level with the battle of this one and that one, to make sure this thing becomes a reality. Because I'm starting to get this feeling and it's never going to happen because everybody is fighting and fighting and fighting. That's question number one. Question number two, and this is a reality statement. Both of you were very close to Senator Coyne. He lost the election, and that's life, I guess. So Senator Klein did a lot for this neighborhood. <laughs> Senator Klein did a lot for this community board. Whether you voted for him, didn't vote for him, the bottom line is he was. What do you two see, and I hope the next person is as good or better, but if the next person does not take on all these projects that Senator Klein did for this neighborhood, does that put a little more pressure on both of you to fill in the gap? That's my question. You can take either question. <laughs> Um, well, the, the Morris Park Station is part of the East Access, the Metro, yeah, the Metro North Morris Park Station is part of the mega plan to have four new Metro North stops on the East Side of the Bronx to increase uh, transportation, as was said. Um, east Side Access is Manhattan, by the way. That's from the Long Island Railroad to the Metro North Station. That has nothing to do with it. It's a separate project. So go ahead. Okay. Um, in regard to taking it a step further, uh, I believe that we need to now, um, encourage our federal officials to get into this fight with us. It is Amtrak that is the holding key to the start of this project. So with somebody on the federal level that can get a little closer to them, I mean, I know we're doing our best in the state level with our calls, our letters, going to the hearings, you know, being a part of the process uh, in the planning. So I look forward to seeing that our next federal representative uh, is in this fight with us. Uh, aside from that, just get a petition going. But, um, but yeah. Excuse me. This is just a matter of building a station, right? It's a matter of going from one to build the station, something I can take maybe a month. No, why are you shaking your head? It's much more. It has to do with using the Amtrak tracks. Okay. And that's the problem. Amtrak wants um, the MTA to pay for the work it's going to take to. Uh, make the tracks accessible. So that's where the fight is right now. Amtrak doesn't want to pay for it. MTA doesn't want to pay for it. It's going to be in the hands of uh, the feds, I guess, uh, well, and the state, and they're going to have to make a part of it. But Amtrak just needs to basically, I guess, 
rush to their schedule because this is part of their plan to fix the pedal main bridge and other tracks. And they do have to extend a little bit, but they just don't want to do it now. So we're asking that they do the repairs now, get it open for it and accessible to us so we can build them the spaces in more in stations in North Park, Park Chester, and Park Stage. Uh, so my point is, this is not like building a second avenue subway. This is no, just building this, one this station. Right That's all it is. It's just a station, yes. Okay. So the tracks are there. We just need it. Access to the tracks. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
If I'm correct, I went to the first workshop when this got presented in 2011 at St. Raymond's, okay? Here we are in 2018, seven years later. Why is this Amtrak issue coming up now? After all of this, that's my question. I mean, it's this is like should have been one of the first things, and I'm just curious why it's becoming an obstacle now. And how because we can get closer to the start date, and as you get closer, now the real money has to be committed, and all along it's okay. we've been discussing it, but now it's about putting the pressure on all of the parties and stakeholders to get this done as promised. The borough president's working on us aggressively. We know that the state is concerned about this. It was a priority for them. The city is concerned. Now it's just making sure that the, those that are responsible, and again, our community doesn't care who pays. Whether it be the city or state or federal government, you just want it open, and you should demand it's open, and you should hold all of us accountable and put pressure on us to make sure that we do our part. Okay, um, we're going to to the deputy inspector. All right. Uh, good evening. So, uh, speaking uh, in regards to this individual that I keep speaking of, um, so I, and, and maybe I can try to explain it in the simplest terms. Uh, and, uh, what Garcelle Park and, and I guess the police department and um, criminal justice reform is trying to uh, accomplish. So they're looking at. Uh, Crime and they're they're analyzing crime and they're, and they're seeing that a small percentage of people are committing an overwhelming large amount of crime in the city. It's a select few people. It's not a mass number. So the so the focus is on those individuals, kind of like the one we were talking about, Jamie Martinez. Um, so they're they're trying to do away with um, incarcerating. Only the bad, the worst of the worst. I guess you could put Jamie Martinez in that uh, category because he does have a lot of crimes fueled by a drug addiction. But they're looking to solve the problem, the underlying problem, not necessarily the crime, but what's driving that crime. And that's his drug addiction. Now, he doesn't seem to be taking that uh, uh, services, and he's not uh, agreeable, I guess, to solving his condition. So, um, what does it take to force him to accept that uh, those services? Because it is negatively affecting this community. It's negatively affecting the businesses. Um, and my plan at first, because like you said, these petit larceny, shoplifting crimes, they're, they're, they're low level crimes. Um, typically, it's uh, time served when you get arrested for this. This is not something you want to put someone away for a long periods of time for because um, I don't know if that necessarily solves the problem. But that's the whole criminal justice uh, aspect. Try to solve that underlying crime. Um, I totally get your frustration. I'm frustrated. Uh, I feel as if he taunts us. Um, I feel as if he has no respect for all the chances he's been provided and all the uh, outreach we have given him. He has no respect for the community, himself, the police department, the process, um, but I understand uh, criminal justice reform, and, and I believe it, to be honest with you. Um, now, this individual should probably be forced into a program. I think he's had enough chances. Um, I think it's an embarrassment to the system. Eventually, you got to take a stance. This might be the guy that you take a stance for. Like I said, I've been reviewing all the people that have been uh, arrested that come through the command on a daily basis. I talk to the Bronx DA's office. I tell them, hey, listen, this is a guy. He's had enough chances. Let's go with it. Um, the process I had put in place was the, up, the charges up to a felony burglary because he's going, he's going back after he was selling the notices. He didn't solve the problem. One of the things that we were talking about uh, at the, uh, um, the town hall discussion in uh, that, that Mark put together was um, why a lot of people, why a lot of these crimes are getting declined prosecution, why a lot of these crimes, there's nobody, uh, it's not going anywhere. People are getting arrested and revolving more mm -hmm. arrests. One of the points that they made up was, um, and this is true, the overwhelming majority of the crimes or the arrests we make have a complaint victim behind it. So in other words, it's a domestic violence complaint. In other words, someone is saying this person harmed me or this person 
uh, stole my property, broke my uh, property, <coughs> damaged my car, did, did whatever, hurt me, shot me, stabbed me. Those are complaint and victim crimes. Those are the overwhelming majority of the, when we make an arrest, it's the majority of them are complaint and victims. When a complaint and victim does not come forward or does not follow up with the Bronx DAs or prosecute the offender, it gives the Bronx DAs a green light to decline prosecution. That mm -hmm. drives up recidivist arrests. So a lot of people, you'll see, a lot of people are getting arrested and their arrests are getting sealed because the complaint victims in a community, whether it's a family member, it could be uh, uh, someone that resides in this community, just had a, a negative interaction with the perpetrator, they're not coming forward and not following up the process. A good, maybe, uh, outcome with this would be to make the process easier for the plaintiff victim. That might be something that we can talk to uh, our self partner about. To make it easier for them to come forward and go through these processes, because it's very um, arduous, it's very uh, time consuming, and it's, uh, it takes a lot. And it's repeat um, trips down to Bronx DA's office, and if they can make the process easier for the complaint and victims, maybe these cases could go somewhere. They also talked about the large volume of cases coming to their uh, command, so they are their, uh, their office. So they have to pick and choose which the ones are going to go to uh, the trial. I understand that it's it's manpower, resource intensive. I I get the, I get that too. I got to pick and choose really which radio runs to prioritize. They got to pick and choose which cases to prioritize. I get that too. Maybe they need more judges. Maybe they need more district attorneys. That could be a manpower issue. That's something maybe you can talk to them about. Um, just like the police department's held accountable for my my uh, uh, seven majors, my major crimes. Maybe the Bronx DA's office gets held accountable on their crime prosecutions and, and, and their uh, uh, um, and they, they have to explain their numbers. That's an idea, um, but I understand. Uh, the changes uh, that's going on with criminal justice reform, I support it. Um, it's it's about solving what's causing the crime. Because, and, and I want you to think about this: the more people we arrest, and you, you got to kind of understand it like this. This is the whole argument about mass incarceration. The more people you arrest, and you give them a criminal justice and a nice number, and they have state identification number the harder it is for them to move on with their lives and get, in a, a, get a, a, a job, and therefore they get stuck in that revolving door of crime. Now my only opportunity is crime. So the whole thought process behind it is we have this thing called the, um, uh, basically forgiveness. If you've never been arrested before, you get arrested for a minor offense, and we have these 14 listed crimes. It's a forgiveness, the first one. You do community service, and maybe you, you get an opportunity. If not, what happens at that point, if you continue uh, down that road, then we process you, and, and uh, we, you end up going through the system. So it's trying to be in an avoidance of the criminal justice season, giving people second chances, opportunities. Um, I get it. I understand it. Uh, I think the process needs to be given a chance. Um, but I also think the Bronx DA's office needs to be held accountable, just like anything else is accountable. Like the elected officials, I'm held accountable. Let, let the Bronx DA's office explain why they're declining prosecution on an individual like this that we're talking about 63 times, 30, 30 arrests in, in 2018. Let them explain that. Um, please speak. Thank you. Deputy Inspector, my concern is not with helping a uh, person who commits a, mm -hmm. a crime once or, tw or even twice, if that crime is not a violent crime. Right. But when someone does something to harm someone else, that's a bad guy. Right. They have that knockout game where they just walk up and knock somebody out where that person is spending two days in the hospital, his jaw is wired, he missed work, his wife's upset, his kids are upset, and this guy is pleading down to... Uh, of simple assault and, and walking, that's not okay because that's a right. bad guy. One hundred percent. And those are the that, and that's what I was trying to tell the DA the other night. Right. Those are the ones I don't I don't have any sympathy for. Right. When they harm another person, they should be put away. Absolutely. Don't plead those cases. So. And what she's doing is she's pleading those cases down. Okay. Well, a 
Okay, that would be something that you have to answer to, but what, what, I, what I'm trying to say is those type of cases, that's a complaint and victim case. So that person that got knocked out, an elderly person, and that's that's an extreme case. I would have said that. Um, Can't complain. That complaint and victim should be, uh, it, the process should be easy for them to seek justice. It shouldn't be arduous, and they shouldn't be dragged through the mill, come down this time, oh, you don't want to help out? Okay, we're going to decline your case. They should be supported by the Bronx DA's office. They, it should be an easy process for them. It shouldn't be a hard process where they have to jump through hoops to prosecute people. That's something that should be addressed, 100%. So, nine times out of 10, those type of cases, I don't see the Bronx DA's office uh, really declining prosecutors. It's really these low-level apprentices where um, shop and stuff like that. Um, but when they have a complaint and victim that is steady and will not drop the case and wants justice and is strong and it makes his appearances, I, I, I hope to God that she's keeping the uh, in charge of hope. It's just it's the process that I think is really needs to be easier for a victim. Well, my honest assessment. Thank you very much, Commander. Um, so now we have the, the rest of the elected officials. Um, we have Tom McCain from the Foxborough President's Office. Je Jeremy, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that the commander didn't because I wanted to ask a question. Okay, Brando, Mike, please. You got one right behind you. Hey, guys. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Oh, sure. Yeah, you, you're talking two hours. How you leave? I have to go to another event. Hi. First of all, thank you for all the work you do and for men out there and your business. I do have an issue and a concern with the Bell Parkway project. A lot of the traffic has been diverted to Astor Avenue and Warren Avenue. There is also an encouraging sign actually telling drivers to go on road. We had a quick conversation requesting for possible placement of, I guess, a police car once in a while on the speeders. There's been at least two or three accidents that I'm aware of. One happened today. How can we go about to kind of encourage people to, first of all, keep to the 25 miles an hour, but they won't unless they get a little encouraging picket. So, uh, can you help us out? Okay, so you're talking about speeding on the <coughs> Yes, and, and ask her. So, I don't have the numbers as far as the, uh, the enforcement or the activity we've done on wearing. We've grown 743 uh, speeding summonses uh, year to date. Uh, which is just down nine from last year. If I can have the uh, traffic uh, officers focus on that court order, do you want that? Yes, I, I would appreciate uh, And I'm not saying daily, but maybe re do a revolving type. Uh, and don't put it exactly on East Chester, put it a couple of blocks uh, west of East Chester Road and where we have it. Yeah, that's the best thing. Like, I, I've spoken about this in uh, regards to like uh, moving summonses. That only temporarily slaps people's hands. It doesn't stop the issue. You have to almost you have to redesign the streets or put up like a speed camera or do a speed bump. You have to do something to slow them down because summonses is just a, a, a temporary deterrent while they're out. But, but with, uh, this is to be honest with you, speed bumps are really restricted to in and around schools. Uh, speed camera, we can talk to the DOT about, or maybe uh, Mark can help us out with that. Um, but it's, Jeremy. Jeremy. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, I just want to add we all know election day is November 6th. There's three items on the referendum in the back. One of them is to limit community boards to term limits. I encourage you to all vote no. I value all of you and I think anyone that part, that is a part of a community board that attends regular meetings, your experience that you've gathered over the years makes you a better community board member. 
And for those of you that want to continue to serve, should be allowed to serve without the fee of term limits. We value experience. Uh, and the other two options I'll leave to you, but I will certainly be voting no on the one that asked for term limits on community board um, members. Thank you. Almost all of you. Almost. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I shared the full report from our president with Jeremy, and I'll ask him to forward the copy to all of you. It's an extensive report, and obviously it will go well beyond my two minutes. Uh, but I do want to mention just a couple of quick things. One is for the new board members specifically, the three members. Um, there is, and I don't care if Jeremy shared this with you yet, there is a land use training session for new board members uh, being held on the 1st of November. I have flyers here and I'll ask Jeremy to be sure that he gets them to you. And then secondly, um, and thirdly actually, are the two requirements that the borough president has placed, one regarding the signing of the EEO policy, which uh, most of you have signed, and just again, the new board members have to have to review it and sign it. And then secondly, you all received a letter from the borough president's general counsel and our EEO director regarding the sexual harassment training session. Uh, this is required by local law, which was passed by the city council. Uh, requires all city employees, all board members of any protected board in the city to take this training course. It can be done one of three different ways. <clears throat> one is you can make an appointment with Jeremy and take the computer-based course in his office. Two, if you happen to be closer to my office, we have computers available for you to take it at my office. You can call me for that. Three, we have been offering lectures for those who do not want to take it on a computer. We had one this past Tuesday. We're having one on November the 15th at 5.30 in the evening, uh, where it'll be a two-hour lecture. If it's, you're coming to the lecture, it's a mandatory two-hour sit-down session. You take it online. It's uh, about 45 minutes. And then lastly, uh, actually two more. If you happen to work down in the city, close to City Hall, they're offering the course at the DCAS offices at 1 Center Street. And then lastly, if you happen to be a city employee, you're already required to take this course as part of your employment. So if you have taken it as part of that employment, all I need is a copy of the certificate of completion. If you get it to me directly, you get it to Jeremy, you get it to me, and your uh, obligation will be fulfilled. Just, no. No. Um, the uh, final thing is that this is a yearly training session. So, You'll be doing it this year, and you'll be doing it again next year. Since the um, sexual harassment training is a mandated um, local law, if you do not take it, the borough president will not consider your reappointment. If you refuse to take it, it's possible that you will be removed from the board even before your time is up on the board. The EEO document also is a document the borough president is requiring you to sign. And once again, if it is not signed, the borough president will not consider your reappointment. Thanks. Okay, um, Joe, Joe McMahon, Council Member Torres' office. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, I put out a few flies over there, and again, it's a, one says lead, a lead screening, but that's ac actually a blood test. So if you need something like that, or you would want something like that, you have to call the office. If you need lead testing for your water, you can call 311, they'll send you a lead testing kit. And there's another uh, flyer up here for some services. Uh, I got a call from uh, a constituent about Bronx Park East and the trees. So since I don't believe anybody, I walk from Old Parkway North up to Allerton, just to see, and in, in my opinion, which I'm not an arborist, I'm not a tree person, looks like there was maybe 50 trees that were down, you know. So I'm gonna have a meeting, I set up a meeting with Jeremy's help with Parks uh, Tuesday, 10 o'clock on Bronx Park East, and we're gonna actually walk it with the Parks person so we can get a plan 
if they need because he said well some of the trees might have to come down or he says the people won't like that i says look let's go let's have a meeting and let's get a plan and decide what we're going to do but it seems to me i walked one spot it was like 600 feet without a tree on the street which i thought was unusual also the councilman uh has funded a exploratory committee for the Alton bid at the last meeting the steering committee voted for offices so uh, that has started, and um, just want to say happy Thanksgiving, happy Halloween to everybody. Don't get scared. I have plenty of candy. I can't believe how many kids come to my door, like four or five hundred. Get out the candy. I'll do that. All right, great. Thank you, Joe. Um, the mayor's office is going to be here, but they did leave a flyer on the table reminding you about the ballot initiatives. We have uh, a representative from Senator Jamal Bailey's office, uh, Rennell. Hi, I'm Rennell from Senator Jamal Bailey's office. I'm his community liaison. Um, the month of October, we had uh, many events. We had um, two domestic violence events. We had one in Mount Vernon, and we had one here in the Bronx. Uh, we also have our Halloween event that's Tuesday from 6.30 to 8.30 at the office. That's 959 East 233rd Street. If you're interested in bringing any children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, um, sons, daughters, we have flyers on the table. Also, we have our business and entrepreneur workshop. That's November 8th from 5 to 8. That's 48, 48 White Plains Road. I also have that flyer. And lastly, we have our mental wellness workshop. I believe this is a very important issue. Um, many of us, we, um, we bypass mental illness, but that's something that we need to really focus on. That's Saturday, November 17th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Dole Center. Um, if you're interested in any of these events, again, they're on the table. Thank you. Thank you. So that ends the uh, elected officials portion of the meeting. We'll move on to the chairman's report now. I'll be a lot briefer, I promise. Uh, motion to accept the uh, minutes. Second. 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 Uh, the other thing I want to mention is on November 28th, we're going to have a town hall meeting at BS 83 at 7 o'clock. It's going to have to do with one of the things that they're going to be that's going to be discussed is the uh, dieting of Morris Park Avenue by the um, by the DO, uh, DOT. Um, the traffic wants to narrow Morris Park to one lane in each direction instead of two. They've done it in different areas. Uh, this board, I think, all but one person voted uh, against it. The uh, Van Ness Association voted against it. The Morris Park Association voted against it. A thousand petitioners voted against it. The store owners of all Morris Park voted against it. And uh, DOT is still planning on doing it. So we're having a town hall meeting on November 28th to bring our elected officials to the media and whatever else we can bring to bear. Uh, the people should decide. If the people decided they wanted a bike lane, that would be fine. But the people decided they didn't want it. Why does government tell us what's best for us? Mm -hmm. We decided against it in every every forum that we put forth, it was voted down almost unanimously. I would say with maybe one or two dissenters. Uh, so why don't they listen? It's been done in drugs neck. And the people from Drogs Neck are coming to speak about how it's a disaster there. They've done it in Tremont. People from Tremont are coming to speak about how it was detrimental to the traffic flow on Tremont Avenue. So, uh, you know, we're obviously, fighting City Hall. Uh, no one seems to care what the people want. They just decided this is what we're going to get, and then, you know, they know better than we. So, on November 28th at 7 o'clock, BS 83, there will be a town hall meeting to discuss this. Question. Uh, yes, Al. Um, one of the things that was brought to my attention um, from Grace was that we need an injunction 
we need, you know, Senator Klein is still our senator. We need an injunction because if everybody is saying that they don't want it in the community, yet there's still the pressure coming from City Hall. This town hall is good, but we need to have an injunction to basically have have to 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 set different wheels in motion. We have letters from all our elected officials. You're right. We have letters, by the way, from all our elected officials, from the congressmen to the senators to the uh, assemblymen to the uh, you know, councilmen uh, opposing this. Doesn't because, matter. Again, they're going with the will of the people. They they represent us, and this is what we want. Uh, but you might be right, or that I'll look into that. Yes, I am right. Okay, great. Um, Treasurer's report, Senator Yes. Uh, the Treasury report has been distributed. If you have any questions, you can hire it myself after the meeting. Also, I'd like to take this time to remind everyone, Sunday, November 11th, at 11 a.m., we have a ceremony at Peace Plaza. Also, there'll be another one at... Yeah. Uh, Van Ness and White Plains at uh, 12 o'clock. Okay? And the period is on the 18th in Charlie's name. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, for my report. So, Tom McKinney already mentioned about the sexual harassment training. Uh, to my surprise, uh, most of almost about half of you have done this already. If you haven't done it yet, please call the office and schedule something or email us. Um, tonight's not a good time because I don't have a, the calendar where I have everything written down in front of me. It's at the office. Uh, as Tom said, it is an annual thing, right? Um, in addition to that, uh, the office, our office, all community boards are being audited. Remember the EEO agreement you signed? Or some of you have signed? Um, that was back in May-ish. Um, I know the newer board members, I know we didn't necessarily collect that from the three new ones yet. Um, we are still need to collect those. 